Already, today we're going to talk about solar flares again. And definitely have been um, influenced by Anton Petrov. I just almost wrapped up. Yeah, I wrapped up watching. This is Petrov's second video on this topic, I think this year. And he's made a couple other, uh, primarily these are the two videos Petrov has made on uh, solar storms or CMEs, coronal mass ejections. I think it's worthwhile to explore the issue, focusing on the basics. So I'm gonna start with like simple five W's, the who, the, the, who, the what, the when, the where, how, uh, modifying that to suit the subject. And if you do a simple search on Google for what is a solar flare, then this is the definition that comes up. Uh, basically a brief eruption of intense high energy plasma uh, or radiation from the sun surface, usually associated with sunspots and causing electromagnetic disturbances on the earth, uh, as with radio frequency communication and the power transmissions. Uh, so basically the atmosphere of earth has different layers. I don't know of all the different layers, but I believe the solar storms can cause up big problems. Uh, the solar storms can cause big problems with the ionosphere which uh, impacts um, the uh, communications aspect, could impact the electricity grid, depends on how uh, powerful and how much impact uh, the solar flare has. I think as with like a volcanic index, uh, with volcanoes, we have a VEI or volcano eruption index. I don't see a similar thing for solar flares. Maybe we need one. I'm just putting the thought out there. But anyway, so come back. This is a simple definition for what a solar flare is. How often do they occur? Uh, based on statistical analysis, I think there's a 11 year cycle. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 11 years or 25 years, but Google's telling me, just going with a very surface level rudimentary search. Um, well, let's read this. The frequency of occurrence of solar flares varies from several per day when the sun is particularly active to less than one every week when the sun is dormant, following the 11 year solar cycle. Large flares are less frequent than smaller ones. Okay, so I was wrong. So basically, what this is saying is it depends on. What, when, which duration you're actually looking at. So apparently the sun follows some 11 year cycle and this cycle may include long periods whereby the sun activity is dormant. But if the sun is more active, then we may see the solar activity in terms of the uh, sunspot picking up. It looks like based on what I observed uh, watching Petrov's video, uh, there's more of a likelihood for a solar storm to emerge uh, once sunspots are observed. So I'm going to put a reminder to myself to put a link to this video uh, in what I'm doing right now. Uh, um, so I'm not sure if this is the actual name of the cycle, but this, the maximum and minimum activity looks something like this. And this doesn't look like a, no, maybe it's 11 year cycle. So I guess I would interpret this graph as that's five years here, 25, right? Yeah, that's five years here. 75 to 85 would be 10 years. Yeah, so like an 11 year cycle here. So during this 11 year cycle, um, so does this mean there, what does this mean? Is it watts per meter squared? What does W represent? And so this is, this is, this is not, a currency, this is the amount of energy given, right? 
Uh, I should be prepared for this video a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, so we are seeing high activity, then low activity, then high activity, then low activity, then high activity. And this seems to be like 11 year cycle here. Exception of the last five years of data is all until uh, 2005. Well, let's see if we can pull up uh, Wikipedia, a very creative common image for solar cycle. Yeah, it really depends. It looks like we've been monitoring this for a couple hundred years. And there was a minimum, uh, monitor minimum cycle. Um, uh, there were a couple of things happening here from the perspective of what also was going on on Earth. I believe this is the, actually, let's not begin. When did the mini ice age happen? 1600 to 1725? Uh, or it's in between that time frame. It's called the Little Ice Age. So it's 1300 to 1860. So it would it be in between? Uh, the solar minimum cycle, but it could be uh, other reasons why that would have happened. So it looks like the mini ice age started a little earlier than 1600, um, but coincided with the solar activity. So it may or may not be a correlation. It looks like this, this, I mean, this period is called the monitor minimum. Then we went to our Galton minimum, and then it looks like in the 11 year cycle that kicked in. If I'm uh, now, in this case, it's going to be the number of spots observed. So we don't necessarily have a gradient with regards to how big the spots were, how small they were, what kind of energy did they unleash, where were they directed at. There's a lot of different ways to look at this, right? And if only if anything, it just begets the question of why are we not doing this? Um, why are we not observing the sun a little bit more diligently, considering that this is the major source for us without the sun or too much sun will be in big trouble, too little sun. Will also be in big trouble. Right now, it seems to, seems to be in the sweet Goldilocks spot, but fluctuations, even tiny fluctuations in the in however the sun functions, could have big, big problems for us. Uh, it depends how you live. Like, well, worst case is we go extinct, right? I don't know. If, uh, uh, well, I don't know. If, uh, we're not talking about supernovae. Well, we are so 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 this one I think CMEs coronal mass ejections. I uh, I think from an very analytical perspective, I think this requires serious um, observation and uh, area of focus. And uh, I I think solar storms have the potential to send us back to the Stone Age, uh, or worse, because as I've shared in the previous videos, if we can't shut down the nuclear power plants safely. Uh, it looks like Canada does that based on the information on the official website. I don't know about the rest of the world. I asked around, I didn't hear back. Uh, uh, but that's one big issue. The other big, big issue is obviously the nuclear weapons, the nuclear uh, weapons uh, malfunctioning, facility malfunctioning, or being launched because um, of some uh, miscommunication. Somebody went offline, you went offline, and X person or in the institution decided to push the button because they saw everything around them going dark and they freaked out. So I know this sounds like, like may, maybe it sounds silly to talk about this. And previously when I was talking about this, I brought up the extraterrestrial angle. So maybe somebody doesn't want to uh, you know, maybe if you're connecting dots, I would think you were connecting the wrong dots because I think this is a very serious issue. Anyways, let's come back. So this is what the cycles look like, right? So 
And the other question that I, and, and again, going back to the five W's, I uh, Googled how fast can these travel? Google, Google's telling me that uh, solar flares can travel as fast as a thousand miles per second. And if I Google, uh, how long uh, does it take for solar flares to reach Earth? I think it's a couple of seconds. Okay, eight minutes. Uh, flares can last eight minutes, two hours. They contain tremendous amounts of energy. Traveling at the speed of light, it takes eight minutes for the light from a solar flare to reach Earth. So 1,000 miles per, was it per minute? Per second. 1,000 miles per second, eight minutes. You multiply the two, I would think, in terms of what the, what, how, how fast light travels to get the distance. Uh, I think I'm getting tired. <laughs> but, but yeah, eight minutes, 1,000 miles. Uh, what else did I do here? Oh, no, I lost my history. No, I think I opened up a different tab. Uh, oh, this is the distance. Uh, this is the actual distance from the sun in miles. And this is distance in. Hmm. Um, well, Google only wants to give us the distance in kilometers. So you can convert that into miles, which is going to be a little bit less than what you see on the screen. Because the mile is a little bit more than a kilometer, right? Okay, so that's kind of covering our five W's. Let's kind of dissect this problem a little bit. So I took a couple of images from Wikipedia. These are three creative, well, creative common images. Uh, and what I did was I loaded them up in this tool, which I Googled. I don't promote them. They have some pesky ads on the site. But I guess you got to make money somehow. Uh, and can I move this zoom bar? Okay, so it's called Luna Pig. I just uploaded the picture here. I think this is drawn to scale. So uh, there, there is an other image that I have. Let me try to bring it up. This is another image. I think this is also to scale. Also from Wikipedia, also Creative Commons. If the sun was represented, in, uh, sorry, if the sun, uh, the, if you represented the surface area of the total size of the sun um, on two scale, then the sun would look this big, Mercury would look like a speck, uh, Venus a little bit bigger than Mercury, and Earth and Venus about the same size. Mars is, uh, Mars is bigger than our moon, but obviously smaller than Earth. So let's see if I can zoom in more. And how much more can I zoom in? So yeah, these are these are images drawn to scale, uh, like I said, and this is what we're dealing with. Uh, the sun that you see in the sky is roughly about this big. Uh, we have to appreciate the fact that the distances are enormous, uh, at least in a solar system wide scale. We're talking like as we noticed um, with the Google search, a couple of it's more than 100 million kilometers, and that's a lot of distance, right? So uh, light travels fast, takes like, like I forget how is it eight minutes. Um, so as the Earth tilts, uh, how, how much was it? I think it was eight minutes. Uh, I think, I'm not sure. Was it eight minutes or eight seconds? I think it was eight minutes. So it takes light that much time to get to work. Uh, and so we're just, you know, light travel is really fast. The distances are enormous. Um, and then, you know, beyond Mars, there's the asteroid belt here. Um, and then you have the gas giants, and we kind of go from that one onwards. Unfortunately, Pluto is not a planet anymore. <laughs> uh, poor Pluto. Uh, I also think of the dog from uh, Mickey Mouse. 
That's just not really how we get it. Okay, anyways, so now this is an image drawn to scale, and this is the other image. So I've loaded both of them up in this tool. Well, I've loaded this one in there. I think it's easier to work with, but I just want to show the other one because it's important to um, get a perspective of what kind of scales we're talking about. Because this image that I've actually loaded up it just contains a snapshot of the sun, right? But it's easier to work with, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. One of the other things in this image, they have a football field. I was trying to figure out what they, what this is. This light distance in seconds, minutes, what is it? So it wasn't that. Then I thought it was maybe millions of miles. Which this represented, but it's actually just a football field. So this is the American football field, and if you play football, then you can kind of gauge what kind of distances are we really talking about. So I don't play football, so I can elaborate a lot on that a lot. Okay, so how should we dissect this? Well, first of all, let's let's take a step back. We're talking about charged energy um, coming our way, which happens every day anyway. When it's happening every day, it is happening at a pace and scale whereby we can um, benefit from, from this. You know, based on how we evolved on this planet, this just kind of works for us, our physiology, and for the flora and fauna, microbiota, other beings, bacteria, viruses around us. Like I said, we're sitting in the Goldilocks zone. That's an actual term. Uh, it's also known as the habitable zone, whereby the temperature is just right for liquid water to exist. So Venus is not in the habitable zone. It's just on the edge. Uh, I believe, well, Earth definitely is. I believe Mars I think is also in the habitable zone. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, so yeah, this is, a, this is good real estate. However, things have evolved in our solar system. We are lucky that we, well, obviously we're lucky. Uh, we're living on the best real estate in the solar system based on our technical, uh, current level of technical uh, evolution or sophistication, however you want to classify that. Now, uh, because the topic is CME or coronal mass ejectory, what you basically have, and you can take a look at Petrov's video where um, he is, uh, he kind of showcases uh, what, what's really going on. Uh, but uh, but um, basically you have the buildup of sunspots, right? So I don't know how big they are to scale. How does this tool work? Oh man, that would really suck if I can't use this tool right now. Choose, hide ads. and choose a tool. Okay, I'm choosing a freehand pencil. So see a thing is build, building up here. Whenever this is ready to cooperate. Oh man. Okay, you know what, what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna use the annotation features in Zoom versus trying to make the Luna tool work for me. Uh, Luna tool fail. Okay, so I don't know how, like it really depends, right? Uh, how, big, how big this solar thing is. Say it's, it's this big, right? Um, I'm not drawing to scale. I don't even know how these things work. And it's kind of, it's doing this thing. Usually I think it's, it's formed something like this. It's like a ring or something like that. I, I think I'm like, there could be many different kinds. Then something happens to it and it kind of, uh, it goes and it starts traveling in a direction. Now that could be any direction. It doesn't have to necessarily face towards Earth. Uh, it could face any, it could be anywhere, right? It could be on the other side, it could be, 
some other direction. Well, what is the probability that one of these things is going to pop and is going to go in our direction, right? So, I, I, again, I don't know. Depends on the scale. Depends on how these things happen. How frequently they happen? Do they happen in one part of the real stage versus the other? That a whole bunch of questions. Some of which I posted in uh, Petrov's uh, video, right? Okay. So, let's imagine that this thing actually popped, right? It popped and it's heading this way, right? And uh, like however it travels, right? This is flat, flat high, high energy well, radiation. And, um, so it's not the standard radiation, it's like it's more concentrated because coming from a CN, coronal mass ejection. Now, If we can spot this weeks in advance, we may be able to do something. That depends on our current level of technological sophistication. If this thing is about to pop in the next five minutes, short of leveraging some kind of an artificial general intelligence that can create and enable a solution really rapidly, I don't know how those that would work. Um, I, I don't know the general advances in the domains of AGI. And I'm gonna reserve my thoughts here because I don't know if it's irresponsible to explore that thought. I, again, also don't know what the advancements are in that area. I also don't know how the universe works. So who knows, right? Who knows? I, I'm just gonna put that question on there. But suppose that Things are the way we understand them to be. They really are. We are at a certain level of technological sophistication. And um, if we don't have anything that can tackle this within the next five minutes, then the thing is going to hit us, right? Now, contingent on how strong this is, So we can we only know how this has happened in the past. So there was a solar storm that's been within the past decades, like I think 2003 in Quebec, which caused a blackout. There have been others. There was the one in I believe the 1800s that Anton mentioned, and I think I talked about in the previous video, which uh, caused uh, that, uh, disturbances or uh, well disruptions for telegraph line, telegraph was the technology at the time. Depends again on how strong this thing is and what it does to the electrical grid. That's one of the first things that comes to my mind. Well, nuclear weapons come to my mind first and nuclear power plants. Because if the meltdown happens or the nukes go off, then we're in big trouble. And then, Everything else comes after. Like I'm, I'm, I'm prioritizing this based on severity. And I think maybe that's the way to look at it because I, there could be something else. But if those things go wrong and something goes wrong in the nuclear domain, we're going to be in big trouble. I think I could be wrong. All the other problems, as complex as they are, are going to happen next. But the nuclear aspect going bad because of this or something else will just compound the issue some by some exponential factor and could put humans on a pretty uh, bad in a very anyways so this is going to be here in minutes if it's already happening and we don't have technology to deal with it then that's it right if we catch it a couple of weeks in advance then uh, maybe something can be done. Now, in the domains of something can be done, what, what, what can we do? What could we do? And um, how should we look at this? Well, there is a variety of ways to look at this. And the things I can think of are to, you definitely got to detect it. What, once they are detected, you can, 
um, this one. Can I move this somehow? And um, I think the green color was chosen randomly. I think I'm not sure. Deflect, destroy, harness. Maybe there is something else we can do, right? Maybe we can reflect it. That would I would I would think that would fall under the domains of deflection. So you're deflecting it to reflect it. Depends how you look at it. I don't know if that's going to be a good thing. I'm not going to get stuck in the sub details right now. But if a CME has is happening, then I can only think of these three areas that we could leverage. So the strategy would I think would come from one of these it's in random order, either deflect it, destroy it, or harness it. And just looking at the scale of this thing, I would think for the better part, unless, unless we want to redesign the global grid system in such a way that we completely shield it from the effect of something like a CME. Anything short of that would mean that we probably, I think, I'm not sure about this. Maybe there's some breakthrough. Somebody has a, obviously a much finer understanding of electromagnetics and charged particles. Um, maybe there are other breakthroughs. But I would think anything short of that would mean that we we'll probably have to tackle this in the domain of a um, mega engineering project. This is definitely going to be in the domain of a mega engineering project. Now I must I must say this is like uh, this is on topic, but like I, as a disclaimer, I am totally invested towards seeing life become multiplanetary, and my thoughts are very biased because any everything anything that would come out of putting shield or doing some kind of mechanism would be able to have an ant like an, a risk management strategy for CMEs would benefit us immensely because all the work most of the work being done in this domain is going to be redesigned repurposed and able to um, help make our vision come true so i just want to put that as a disclaimer uh, that being said i also think that and from my uneducated perspective that a significant disruption could indeed be really bad for humans and I don't know how you would classify uh, the problem. I've tried to share the nuclear angle and everything. Say nuclear power plants can be shut down. Say there's no nuclear war. If it is significant, it's coming directly in the path of Earth. And it, if it does uh, destroy the grid system or degrades it, uh, it depends on the severity and, and the frequency of how this, these kind of things are happening. But we could be out for weeks, months, maybe years. Who knows? Because there's only a handful of companies, uh, sorry, uh, companies too, but countries where electrical equipment is made. And uh, I don't know if wires are going to get fried and stuff like that. I don't have the uh, domain expertise in this area. But we're not just talking about the grid. We're talking about everything that is not shielded and has a motor. I think, I think I'm, I could be wrong. So uh, effectively, we could be back in the Stone Age for months, if not years, maybe decades, maybe longer, I don't know. But we're definitely looking at the months to year time frame. And uh, we're gonna be like booting back civilization up in uh, pockets, right? And uh, suffice to say, there's gonna be significant disruption to day-to-day -day lives. And considering the fact that we are all enormously dependent upon a global interconnected system, every life is going to be impacted by an event like this, right? So again, this goes down to the probability of something like this happening. 
I don't know. It's the same thing as the asteroid deflection system, right? Or like just just the probability of an asteroid striking. Um, so I don't know if I made something on that. Or like a major volcano going off, right? So probability, I don't know. I don't know if it's low or how do you categorize this. Each one of these things is different, but the impact could be quite significant. Now to come back to the the choices at hand, I think a CME would either be deflected, it would either be destroyed, or it would be harnessed. How would this happen? Let's let's take a look here. And how should I do this? I'm going to pick random colors. And I'm going to say uh, the strategy for uh, deflection would be blue. Okay. The, stra uh, the strategy for destruction would be red. And the strategy for harnessing it would be green. Something like that. Okay, so let's we'll go in the order that things are in front of us. If the, and this is just one of the main ideas, if it's decided that the coronal mass ejection will be deflected, say something, you know, like there's data suggesting it's happening like five years, 10 years down the road, 15 years. Um, breakthroughs will be needed in a variety of different areas. And global cooperation is going to be pivotal. But uh, anyway, so I will get to the thing. How would this be deflected? I don't know. <laughs> I would think you would put some kind of a shield, right? So let's see, let's suppose uh, we're very, I am very biased when I'm talking about this because we want to do exactly that. We want to put a shield right here. The part facing the sun, we want to put a shape that opens and closes. It has slits. So the, it, the sunlight only goes through slits. Uh, it's not going to be at this scale. It's not going to be that far. It's going to be actually quite close to the orbit. It's going to be close enough so it doesn't impact the Earth, Earth or any other planet, even Mercury. But uh, the slits are going to allow a fine amount of sunlight to go through the planet, and then there's going to be other constructs to sequester the carbon dioxide. So just like there's this thought at the very least idea of putting uh, a shield around Venus, uh, a similar stru structure could indeed be enabled around Earth. Now, for Venus, we're thinking of primarily leveraging or making use of the real estate for agricultural use. I don't know when the first humans are going to be landing on Venus. Um, I think a fair bit of work needs to happen before that happens. But then again, technology is also scaling fast. So I, I'd still be astounded if it's in the next 15 years. Maybe, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong here. But there's a cluster of problems here. Earth, on the other hand, really good real estate. Like I said, habitable zone, you know, things have been pretty okay the past couple of uh, billion years, I, I would say, um, which has evolved, allowed life to evolve in a variety of different ways. The most significant uh, event that we've seen on Earth, well, it depends how you look at it. Right, there's been many events. There's been the Cuba type catastrophe, which almost wiped out human life, which is questionable. There's research to suggest that the Cuba type catastrophe did cause a population bottleneck. It's called TOBA, right? It's a TOBA catastrophe. You can Google this. So there is uh, research to suggest that there was a genetic bottleneck. There is research to suggest that there wasn't. So I don't know which side is right. I haven't looked at the map. So that's one way of looking at this, right? But in terms of like significant, significant uh, disruptions, the, the last major one, there have been many smaller ones, but the major one was 66 million years ago. So it takes roughly about 
240 million years for Earth or the store this whole thing that you see in front of you. It takes 240 million years for this whole solar system to go around the galaxy. Right? So six by four twelve, uh, sorry, six by four twenty-four. So one quadrant would be around 16 to 16 million years, 66 million years. So if we were if we are here in the galaxy at nine o'clock, right? We're kind of going opposite. So uh, th this much time has passed, just a quarter, for an entirely new species to emerge on this planet, from dinosaurs to humans. 60 million years, 66 million years, right? It just makes you appreciate time, the, 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 the perception of time. We think time is going by fast, but think about the fact that we have only covered one quarter of the galaxy and a new species has emerged on our planet. That's quite significant. And we still have these three quarters of the distance to go around the galaxy. We still have 180 million years to go around the galaxy. Kind of, sort of, right? Uh, if you turn the clock back more, so that was just 60 million years back, right? If you go all the way back, if you go 240 million years back, I should not say talk about all this because it may seem like I'm trying to paint a picture of, I don't want to talk about all these things, but I'm just talking about the scale of time. 240 million years ago, roughly about, there was a significant, also another significant event on Earth, which was an extinction event. And that was the biggest one. The dinosaurs getting wiped out was not the biggest one. 240 million years ago, I can't remember what exactly happened, but that was the big uh, significant destruction on our planet. The point is, things happen in the in this in the universe, in the solar system, in the galaxy, and we have to be prepared, right? So I almost don't want to talk about all that because it takes away from the subject, but I just want to categorize that, um, you know, um, th this is where we are at. So anyway, so deflection, come back to deflection. So I think it makes sense to, anyway, so how, anyways, I want I to talk about make sense or any other thing. How would you deflect the rain? Deflection system for an uh, asteroid, I would think would look Quite different. The deflection system for um, ACME would also be very different, unless there's like a multi-purpose system, one system to tackle a variety of different um, problems or threats. The most logical, uh, I, I, well, the, the the example that I can think of, and my thoughts are influenced because I was taking a look at heliogen yesterday, and actually, uh, this this is one of the ones I want to really talk about. I want to talk about this, but this is like I think this would be a win-win. This one we are kind of redirecting the energy somewhere. In this case, we're not really destroying energy. We can't destroy energy. We're still uh, uh, deflecting it. This is this is probably the same thing. But how would this happen? So I spoke about the shields around Venus and the slits on Earth. I don't know where it's going to get deflected to. You don't want to deflect it towards Mars because there may be a future colony on Mars. You don't want to deflect it towards the moon because there may be uh, settlements on the moon, some mining structures, whether they are human powered or like there are humans present there or not. Uh, you don't, you don't want to, I, I guess it's for, for something like a solar CME, like a thermal mass ejection, I think it's okay to deflect it just in the in, in like some random part of the solar system because they're really not going to travel that far. An asteroid, I would, I would actually not do that because the, what I'm about to say next may sound funny, but the asteroid could tumble in the vastness of the solar system, maybe escape the solar system at some point and go hit some place somewhere in the galaxy. Um, hundreds of millions of years, maybe longer later. And what if there's life there, as crude as it may be? So I don't think we should just tunnel and redirect rocks really nilly around the galaxy. So going a little off topic, but to come back to the idea, I think 
the deflection system would be pretty simple. It would, and if I'm if I'm going just to scale, they, they would basically be umbrellas, but they just they wouldn't be umbrellas made out of regular material. These would be umbrellas, right? So if you open up an umbrella, it looks like this. But a telescopic umbrella, uh, the, if you create structures and put them in geosynchronous orbits around Earth then, and you put them like this, so that from the perspective of surface area, it's, if, if I am Earth and you are the sun, so it, they would be like this, right? Kind of like this. Or maybe they will be like this, right? So the sunlight would still get to Earth. That's not gonna have a, retrograde effect, more comparability with harness sunlight for our needs, the power of global grid. Um, you know, maybe there's a space station on Earth in the next five years that is uh, substantially bigger. So, like that. so uh, I mean, relatively speaking, relative to the size of the Earth, the, sh the shields are not going to take Actually, how, how, should, how are we going to do this? I don't know how the geosynchronous orbits really work. Do the geosynchronous orbits, the geosynchronous orbits must have, there must be an entire 360 all the way around set of geosynchronous orbits. I don't think there's only one geosynchronous orbit. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but this structure would be placed in all of the geosynchronous orbits, right? So now let's draw this out. Let's ignore the picture in the background. Let's draw it out. Now imagine this is Earth, right? This is Earth, okay? Um, and the sun is, is here somewhere still, and that's pretty far. Uh, we want to shield against coronal mass ejection. So where are the geosynchronous orbits? The geosynchronous orbits are here. Well, actually, I guess begin the question, does it really have to be in the geosynchronous orbit? And if it has to be, then why does it have to be in the geosynchronous orbit? I'm actually going to come back to that thought in a second. Um, because maybe you don't need geosynchronous orbits. You just need the ability to be able to provision these deflection constructs in a particular coordinate system contingent on where the CME is really coming from. Well, let's explore the geosynchronous orbit aspect. So this is a 360 view. This is not just one orbit. You know, this is all the way around. But this is how geosynchronous orbits really work. Now it's starting to look like magnetic field, which is not what I want. Right? But now we have this, we have mapped the habitat in, in the different orbits. And if this was the view, Right, and Earth is facing us now, this way, and it is also facing the sun. But imagine we are the observer, we're at, we're at, this is exactly the way we're at this. So, that structure that I'm going to draw it with another color now, uh, maybe just to make it stand out. So, these, uh, these, these umbrella like structures would face the sun. Okay, they would face the sun like this, they would be like here, so they would be in the orbit. They would be here and there would be distance between them. And I will share the reason why that would happen in a second. Maybe you need a maybe you need a cluster of them. Maybe you need to position one after the other. And then you need a primary one, secondary one, and a tertiary one. The probability that all three are going to fail is pretty low. The probability that a cluster of them will fail because the corona mass ejection hit them before they were electrical malfunction, that, that depends on testing, right? So if, if that there's a barrier and this one fails, the CME is gonna come through here. And that's also a problem, but let's not get stuck in that problem zone. So if CME, now again, anyways, come, focus here, okay? So, so that is one deflection system that could be built. Now, what is this thing? I, I mentioned umbrella. What is, what is this really? How would this work? 
Well, this is a telescopic umbrella structure. I got this idea because Kevin Kong uh, owns Head Dog Umbrella and I talked to him sometime. He's also from Toronto. Uh, brilliant mechanical engineer. In fact, if anyone's going to build an umbrella for the solar system, it's probably going to be Kevin. Uh, we're going to be there right there to assist you, buddy. And uh, Ivan uh, will also play an instrumental role. Uh, obviously, we're, we're not going to do this alone. So we're going to need all the help and support from American uh, defense and Canadian and Japanese and all the NATO allies. It's going to be a worldwide endeavor. This is not going to happen if you pick and choose sides. If the Chinese and the Russians are not on board, this cannot happen because, well, I guess I can just, they have you, everyone has to be on board for something like this because this has to be maintained by everyone, built by everyone for peaceful, cooperative purposes. Also, if this gets in bad hands, then it could be a force of tyranny. And, you know, so the promise and peril of technology. So I'm not going to go off on that hand right now, but that's important to consider. All the ideas should be considered and carefully evaluated before, I think, hey, so come back. And I'm not saying there's no way this kind of idea can be used. But basically, the, so to come back, you know, there's lots of power coming here anyway. So it's going to be a grid system uh, in orbit. So it's not just going to be these structures themselves. There's going to be means to be able to power them in the first place. But basically, what's going to happen is there's going to be sensors. Well, there's going to be whatever the, the detection systems are right now, there's a, what's it called? VK Solar uh, Telescope. Uh, it's in Hawaii. This is the best right now in our solar system for observing the sun. So the VK Solar, VK, VKS, I think, uh, some, something, I forget what it was that the abbreviation stands for. But this is Earth based, and this is the best, like I said, mechanism for detect, uh, the, 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 for observing the sun. The data and the images this telescope sent back are just uh, based on the video I just saw from Anton. The, these are, this is the best. So, but maybe there needs to be different versions of the same kind of structure in different points across the solar system. So that we have a much, not just a much better understanding of the sun, but we have redundancy. And uh, so that's one part, right? So the question then is, uh, can we place it closer to the sun? Is there actually going to be more advantage to doing so? Right? Because it will still take X number of, X, like a short amount of time for a coronal mass ejection to actually hit us. Should it happen? So what are the advantages? Well, if your detection system is here, stuff is happening here, and it takes X number of time, X amount of time, uh, maybe I should use, it takes, I'm just picking random, it takes Y amount of time for, Y amount of time has to elapse for things to get here, right, this here. Uh, I, I would think logic would state it makes sense to put something here, right? Now you can't here because there's no material, then you put some something here, right? Um, I don't know how close is the closest thing that we can send to the sun, but I would think the sentinels should be closer to the source. I think I could be wrong, right? Maybe you have a really, really clever mechanism of detecting the sunspot, and you have a very high rate of prediction, success, successful prediction. In this case, you can just keep the observation unit anywhere. My whole point is if the deflection systems are sitting here, somewhere here, right? It, they, the deflection systems are going to be like close to work, I'm thinking, unless it's some massive colossal structure, right? We're not even, we, 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 this is very hypothetical. We, we don't even know where the material is going to come from. We don't know a lot of other things we don't talk about in this video. I think this is going to be a fairly long video. 
for at least another 40 minutes in case you were thinking of pausing and taking a break uh, or maybe 30 minutes. So yeah, we don't have an answer to a lot of these. How would this structure be powered? How can this thing be made in the first place? What materials is it going to be made out of? Where are these materials going to come from? How are we going to get this material in orbit and beyond? How are we going to position it? How are we going to maintain it? How are we going to build a communication structure? We don't have internet. Well, so a lot of questions. What if, like, you know, like, so anyway, so suppose this is the this is the thing. And you know, this is kind of this this is like a um, more expansive version of this idea. Now let's focus on one of these individual units. What does this look like? Right. I think I'm going to draw it somewhere here. I think the, sh the umbrella would look like this, something like this. It's again, point, it's pointing towards the earth. Sorry, the uh, one side is pointing towards the earth, and the other side is pointing towards the sun. It's literally like an umbrella, right? It's literally like an umbrella. However, you want to make this, you probably want to have not too many moving components in here because you want this thing to open up fast and do the job that it's intended to do. Okay, so this looks like an spider, and this is like in a semi-open position. In the so in a in a closed position, it would look like this. Maybe it's really flat, right? Relatively speaking, I don't know how big these things are going to be, and I don't know how many of these you will actually need to protect the earth. I don't know how many layers of these you are going to need. What if the primary layer fails? Imagine this whole thing is one layer. And there's a breach, the primary layer is completely failed. Then the secondary layer has to be made. Then the third tertiary. What if all three layers fail? Are we going to say we're pooched or something else gets in? I don't know. These are all good questions. But yeah, so this one is in a closed state to come back to this thing. This one is in a closed state. This one is in a semi open state. So this should really have been here. And let me see if I can cut it and move it. I'm just going to draw it again. Okay. So this is the close thing. And say the sentinel sends a signal. This is a test, right? We're just running a test. I, I don't know where the sentinel is. This, this isn't actually going to be positioned here. Like I said, they're going to be positioned somewhere. Maybe positioned somewhere else. Maybe there's three layers. Maybe. I don't think it's going to be uh, in the middle of Venus and Earth. Um, I think they're all going to be close to Earth. I could be wrong. I'm not a celestial mechanics guy or person. But we're just expanding on this right now and then focusing on one of these, one of the main units. Close position looks like this. Then the sentinel, wherever that happens to be, sends a signal, right? So this thing receives a signal. It has to happen really fast. Now the question is, how will that happen? Because it takes light to get. Hold on, I, I will. Um, how long does it? How long does it take for light to get from sun to the earth? Light distance from sun to the different planets in the solar system. Okay, so I don't want to navigate away from this, so I'm going to just pull it up here.
light distance across solar system. Okay, yeah, this is what we want. So this is six minutes from Earth. If a CME is happening, okay? If a CME is happening, let's say we do a CME. Just imagine it happens to be here and all the planets are exactly like this, although they're not aligned like this. If a CME travels towards Venus, it's gonna, and it's bad one, it's gonna take six minutes to hit Venus. Supposing that it's actually traveling at the speed of light. I don't know if they travel a little faster, they travel slower. I'm thinking they will travel at the speed of light based on some of the preliminary researches we've done. So Earth has 2.3 more minutes. Because to get to Earth, it will be it's getting a little messy but it is 8.3 minutes to get to Earth. Mercury is 3.3 minutes. Okay. But the thing is, I, well, one of the things I'm thinking about, and Mars is 12 minutes, almost 13 minutes, 12.27. Where is Mars? Mars is here. Okay. So I was thinking the center node, the, 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 the sensor, the sensor-based system. The sensor-based system cannot sit on a planet because the planets have these... Uh, the, the orbits are not stable like this. Like it's not like Earth, Mercury is here, Venus is here, and Earth is here. Like this. Yeah. the orbits are like, you know, they're they're also not uniformly shaped. So, but but well, relative to some of the other objects in the in the solar system, like or, uh, the orbit, or the, some of the asteroids and comets are really weird. Um, with the sun was here, some of the stuff is like. They have a really eccentric orbit. So that's called orbital eccentricity. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the planets have re somewhat regular orbits compared to some of these uh, crazy orbital eccentricity. <laughs> that's something. Uh, uh, objects. But the Sentinels did not just go on the planets exclusively or the moons around them. Because there's no guarantee that the signal from one planet to another is going to get to us in time, right? Because one planet could be here, and another planet could be here, and the sun is here. And these distances are enormous. So in my, in, you, however you can say you, you have satellites in different parts of the solar system now, not just around Earth. It may, it may take, I'm thinking, a fair bit of time for the signal to bounce and come here from the speed of light. Right? So the question is, where must the sentinels be positioned? I think that's a good question. 
I think that's a good question. Where must these sentinels be positioned? Because time would be of the essence. Suppose this structure can indeed be built. Suppose there's consensus, suppose there's a technological breakthrough, suppose there's a material gain. Suppose, well, communication faster than light. Well, let's talk about this. I think I saw something here and they were talking about these things. They, this is, has to do with quantum computing. I don't understand how that works. But it sounded to me like FTL calm, not FTL travel. Faster than light calm. So I, I could be wrong about this. Maybe there was just a storage mechanism. But I can share the resources with somebody from NASA or whoever. NASA probably knows about that. But, but the question is if, if I, 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 could, I could have interpreted that wrong when I saw that. Maybe it's just a storage device. But my, my point is, I think you will need a PL com, right? Because you need to be able to replicate that information instantaneously. Because yeah. if the signals are indeed taking three minutes to get to us, say the sentinel is sitting on the polarized cap from Mercury, right? Actually, again, that's not a good example because it's like the orbits. The Mercury could be here or here, could be on the other side of the sun, we are here, and there's this enormous distance between us. And even though, you know, I, I, I don't know, like this, this is, you gotta think, so, If I don't get stuck in this problem, which I think this is an important problem, like where, where, where is this, if this thing is actually developed, where will the sentinels be placed? That's, I think that's a crucial, this is a crucial question. Is a question of a lot of, a variety of different factors, but the most important of which is the time aspect. How, how effectively and how efficiently can the sentinel do his, do, do, uh, do his job, which is to, send the signal back to Earth and, or, or somewhere to, the, to this thing. We wanted to send the signal here because the, the, this thing is just doing one thing. You know, this is a dumb construct. It's designed to do one thing. It's to open and close. That's it, at least for the purpose of pure deflection. It may have multiple layers, you know, it could open up and become this wall, or it could, uh, it could generate a magnetic field. I don't know how it would do that. So you need a core, you need a core and you need to spin it, I think, in order to be able to generate a magnetic field. Um, to generate a magnetic field that would deflect and pass like that, like that uh, the CME would require a fair bit of energy. I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point. I don't even know if you can do that. If you can tackle a CME with some electromagnetic function or some plasma that is generated, I don't know anything about that area of research. Right? It could be that you grow something on these structures uh, really, really rapidly, like really, really rapidly growing fungi. I have no idea how you're going to do that in the, <coughs> excuse me, the vacuum of space without carbon. Maybe you can apply carbon, you spray it on it synthetically or through some means. But the thing is, that thing is going to take the hit, it's going to burn. You're really burning a lot of it, it's going to leave dust and residue in the solar system. And well, CMEs doesn't look like they happen a fair bit, but that thing would not be a sustainable solution. Uh, yeah, that, that, that would not be a sustainable solution because if the CME gets progressively worse. We're not going to put something in its path and we'll be able to, for that thing to take the heat. Um, 
why would you want to burn it? You want to burn it because if it's just like, like it's, it keeps coming in that direction for an extended time frame and with the shield of the light, I mean, that's not a good idea. Anyways, to come back to the mechanism, let's focus on the mechanism. I think this is important. I, yeah, okay. How, like, you know, this, some, the sentinels, sentinels are the big question, sentinels. Sentinels, sensors, where are they gonna be placed? Where are they gonna be placed, right? Anyway, to, to find that thought, so now, you know, the sentinel has sent a signal directly to this construct and it's done that in time. And what the umbrellas are simply gonna do is, based on the signal that is received, they're gonna start opening up, right? And they have to open up really fast. They cannot take half a minute to open because they only have one job to do. When they are open, they will look. I don't know if you want to make them like this or you want to make them like this, right? That depends on fluid, di fluid dynamics and uh, other things, FEA and uh, whatnot. So whatever gets you the 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 utility. There's a reason why you made these things. And the reason why these things were made is so that the CMEs are deflected. So whether you make it in this format and you know you kind of hook them all together, not hook, but like once they open, their positioning has to be really well. Um, so they they you know make kind of like a wall. They they were they were like these uh uh, they were like this, right? If you were the sun and I was, the, I was sitting somewhere behind one of the structure of the wall, then you would see this, you would see this, and I would just obviously see you, right? Right? But now, if this is open, we're going into more detail. Now, if this is open, then you would, if it was open, then this would, I'm just showing this for uh, illustrative purposes, is actually going to be bigger than this. But when it's open, you will see this, and there's going to be a whole cluster of these. There's going to be here, here, here. So when they're all open, you would see a wall, right? So now the question is if the wall performs the utility that we're talking about, and that would be deflection, right? Deflect, how would it deflect? That's more like reflect or absorb, right? Uh, maybe you can make it out of nothing. So you can, you can, the, this part of the thing, the sentinel, or the, this is not the sentinel, the company, this thing, this part, you make it out of here. So there's a little bit of like this, and it's like, I don't know how you would do that. And then you open them up, right? You have to be really resilient in here because I don't know what kind of energy we're talking about from CMEs, depending on uh, what kind of CMEs, right? Uh, you make them out of yours and then you deflect them. Right? So if something hits it, it just goes to another part of the solar system. And by the time it has traveled a certain amount of distance, I think for this one, it's going to be okay. I think the heat is going to dissipate. So the overall temperature in that part of the solar system may fluctuate a little bit, but then that's going to be a small compared to the scheme, compared to the size of the solar system. So, solar system is not like there's going to be a small amount of energy fluctuation, and I think that's going to be really it, right? It's not like these things are happening every well, not every day, every second. So, it's not like um, the overall temperature going up in the solar system is going to be a big problem. That's what, that's what I'm thinking of in terms of deflection. Destroy, destroy, destroy. Well, I am not. Ooh, what did I just? I think I read something I should know. Okay, so that was that was deflection. Destruction, destruction. I said that three times before and two more times. <laughs> what are we doing in the domain of destruction? Well, if the CME is happening here, right? We could just bomb it. 
but I don't know if that's a good idea. That's how they go. I don't want to laugh. I don't, I don't mean to laugh at this. That could be a really bad thing because I don't know how the sun works. Uh, you may solve that problem there, but you could create a whole host of other problems. I have no idea what kind of effects are really happening in the sun. And I am, um, I'm very hesitant to do anything like that. I think they've dropped like uh, satellites and stuff like that in the, in the sun. But uh, I, I think before it even enters the sun, it gets burnt long before uh, it even touches, um, it even goes close to be like, you know, beyond this point, or like something like that. I'm just making that up. But if you were, if we're talking about bombing something, first of all, I don't know how something is going to be delivered beyond this region. Temperature starts going up quite a bit and around here, right? Even here. So I don't know how we're gonna like whatever whatever is going on here, right? You have you have it get to pass this and pierce it. Oh, another idea I was thinking of and going back to deflection is instead of this thing being built around the earth, if we could get something to another part of the solar system really, really fast. Then instead of putting the shield around the earth again, you would put the shield right here. It would go closer to the sun. In this case, it would travel there really fast. It would open up. And once it opens up, this is not drawn very well. But once it opens up, it gets closer to that place really, really fast and deflects it or absorbs it or does something else. I can't think of it destroying it. It depends how you look at it. If it deflected it and gone and kind of destroyed it. But it's, it's mostly deflection or harness, right? Now, the question is, how, what is that even, like I'm just thinking pure, pure hypothetical, like, Super sci fi. Well, Breakthrough Starshot uses something called a solar sail, right? Breakthrough Starshot uses a solar sail. And what they do is, though, what they're doing, I forget the name of the scientist behind this, fill, fill something, fill, I forget, I forget. But the, the scale, the way I understand it, it works something like this. So you basically take really con no, I don't want that. I want I want this now. I'm, I'm just demonstrating how I think the uh, solar sail works. So you take really, really concentrated laser, right? Imagine this is really concentrated laser. And then you have a sail. The idea is really simple, but it's a, it's a really interesting engineering problem. And then you have a sail. No, I don't want this. I want this. You, 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 you basically have a sail, right? I don't know how I'm going from memory. And No. How is it a sales structure? I think it was something like this. So there's a there is the payload, which is a small component, the electrical component. I don't think that laser hits the thing. It hits the laser hits the sail. And this, the sail gets propelled by these really, really concentrated beams of energy, in this case, laser. Okay. So I'm not going to talk too much about this because I really don't uh, remember. It's been a while since I looked at so, uh, Breakthrough Starshot. But the Breakthrough Starshot project can. 
speed up the solar sails X percentage of the speed of light. I forget what it is. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't, I, I could you, I don't know actually. I don't know if it's 90% the speed of light. But it, it, it's, it's not 0.1%, it's definitely not 2%. I, I can't remember. Let's do it. How far does the breakthrough star shot sales travel? Yeah, Phil Lehman, Lumen. That's what that means. Oh, Dr. Avi Boyd is uh, part of the uh, uh, leading team as well. That's pretty cool. You're a very good guy. Wow, this 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 team is so spectacular, man. It's so amazing. This is a really respectable team. Amazing team. Very few star shots. Okay, I, I hope it's okay to share the event because I don't know if they are very prominent, but this is what the solar sail looks like. Okay. At least that's the way they're hypothesizing. So they put the satellite right here. I don't know how big this thing is, really. Let me give this. Four meters by four meters. So the craft would be propelled by a square kilometer array of 10 kilowatt ground based laser with a combined output of up to 100 gigawatts. A swarm of about 1,000 units would compensate for the losses caused by interstellar dust collision on and, and route to the target. We're talking about some technological challenges. The near star system is 4.3 light years from Earth. This is the Alpha Centauri star system. The nearest stars, not those stars, the Centauri star system. They're talking about the specific kind of craft with the specific kind of sail traveling at the speed of 20% and 15% of the speed of light. Yeah, well, that's not gonna work. Because if something's coming in here in six minutes, and if something travels at a fraction of the speed of light, we basically have, you know, it's not going to be able to get there fast enough. Unless you build a bigger sail and you, you build like some contraption, like kind of like, uh, not contraption, contraption is a word that means badly designed set of things. You build some clever invention that can indeed get the thing to a particular point in a in close to the speed of light. Okay. I have no idea how relativity plays with it. I have no idea. Okay. I don't understand relativity. 
I don't understand the time aspect and how time and relativity play together. But I am thinking, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, if we send a graph to a particular point in the solar system at or close to the speed of light, once the force is exerted and the right amount of force is exerted, how is it actually, let's think about this. First, you will power this thing up and then you will shoot it. And then it will accelerate really fast. And it's gonna travel a finite amount of distance in this case. Then you have to stop it. There's a lot of calculations here. I don't know, man. I am not an astrophysicist. I have no idea how relativity really works, but something about this tells me that if we're trying to send something in particular parts of the solar system and we're trying to send there really rapidly and stop it really rapidly, I don't even know how that will work. We don't have any propulsion system that can do that today. I don't think so, right? So you would uh, say you do put up a really big solar sail and you attach it to something that looks like a John Hunter space gun and you can like boom, 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 send a lot of these things and then they open up and they have some ionic uh, ion engines or something and they self-arrange themselves in that target region. But before all of this happens, it has to stop. It is traveling 30, 40% of the speed of, off the speed of light, right? So it has to stop and it has to do all of this in seconds, if not minutes. So I don't know how that's gonna happen, but I think it's worth exploring at least even from the perspective of um, a thought experiment. I must say that the same technology that powers breakthrough star shot is hypothesized. And I, I guess I can share uh, an episode on all that. I'm not privy of any interesting thing, but I'm just, I just go to Wikipedia. <laughs> so, it is hypothesized that the technology of power to break star shot could be the same technology that gets us to Mars in days, not months, days, right? Not months and years, days. But that's again, at least cargo ship, autonomous cargo ship could get to Mars in days. Stuff going to Venus coming back in days elsewhere in the solar system. Uh, you have to harness a fair bit of energy and uh, at least the way we're envisioning this right now. Who knows what's going to happen in the future? Maybe there's breakthroughs in things like negative energy or um, uh, something else, right? Uh, antimatter drives. Um, yeah, the company's working on antimatter drives as uh, futuristic as it may seem. Okay, so yeah, that was just a thought that if you have to get stuff here versus building a wall here or something. How would that happen? So I think that was an interesting detour, if I should say so myself. We were on the topic of dis destroying. So bombing this doesn't seem like a good idea to me. You know what I mean? Uh, too many, too many, uh, too many things could go wrong. Too many, uh, too many things could uh, get destabilized here. Could cause more uh, CMEs to happen. Then maybe later, maybe could have a butterfly effect, uh, equivalent of. So I think this is out of the question. I think I'm not sure. Maybe you can bomb it here, right? But. The shock wave would travel, same thing, you know, same thing, butterfly effect, right? How do you draw a butterfly? Yeah, Me and how are you? Are you outside? Okay. Uh, half an hour? Yeah, it should be good. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm really sorry about yesterday. Just uh, <laughs> just communication. No, it should be good to happen. Or I'll see you outside. Oh, no. that's right. Oh, no worries. Okay, so back here, sorry about that. Uh, I don't want to pause the video. I don't know, you know how you do that. Okay. So doing it here would the same issue, right? Shockwave, shockwave, both ways actually. Uh, plus we don't know, like if you can bomb a CME. You can bomb a fire, <laughs> apparently. The Soviet, uh, so former Soviet Republic, somebody did that. There was a fire that was out of control. I forget if it was an oil well or something like that. They just nuked it. They nuked the whole thing. Um, now that we know, like, uh, like we, we're not going to do that kind of stuff today because we know that, uh, well, going to have an impact on the place itself and in the environment and the particles are going to keep rotating there and we're going to breathe it so and other problems like that you know? like, that's, so what other destruction mechanism could be leveraged i don't know man i don't i don't think about these kind of things at least i don't think i think about this this would be in the domains of somebody who likes thinking about this kind of stuff, like bombs and explosions and rays and uh, stuff like that. So uh, for this purpose, and if it's approved by the military, there have to be some kind of oversight for even exploring costs like this, I would think. Uh, then going to explore that but it has to be global i wouldn't do this in a nation state level and not not as a thing against anyone what if you're tricked into making a weapon right whoops so yeah and yeah and so okay so i don't know i can't think of i don't think i can think of any other ideas to destroy um uh, It really depends on the scale, how big this thing is, you know, how it's traveling, is it traveling in a concentrated form or like or more dispersed? What current level of technological state we're in? And there's a combination of these questions and more that would determine what the solution for something like this could be. Harness, harness, let's talk about harness. The harness mechanism would be pretty similar to the deflection mechanism is what I'm thinking. Because everything that I shared with regards to the deflection mechanism would feed right here. Only that instead of hunkering down, if I was a shield and I was hunkering, I'm not conscious. Well, I have a consciousness of two or four or 10, depends how you look at it. I'm not as dumb as a toilet flush, uh, like Douglas Hofstadter would say, Michikaku says, Dr. Michikaku would say, a thermometer, a thermometer has a consciousness of one, I would say it's two, so you're going up and down. Consider the fact that you're not really thinking about the quantum mechanical computations or functions that are happening within the subset of mercury molecules. If you don't factor that in and roll it into what is happening, then it's a simple function of up and down, so it's two. Right, so the shields are going to have a function of maybe hundred, maybe a thousand. Depends how you look at it. What about the code that powers it? Right. What about the code that powers? It? Anyway, so I would go into a philosophical thing here. But generally speaking, the, uh, like I think the thing is going to be dumb. Right. There's always that risk that somebody may reprogram it, and I always I already spoke about the. It, 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 the ill intent angle and uh, you know hijacks the wall or something like that, blocks the sun, then says, pay me some money so that I will you know open up the sun again. 
uh, possibility exists. Hard to do that kind of stuff if you are uh, doing block, uh, sorry, uh, blockchain and also Bitcoin. Just said, yeah, you know, just saying it's uh, it's really hard to do that kind of stuff with Bitcoin. I don't know how that all works, but I'm just saying. But let's not talk about the money aspect right now. Um, and I'm not saying it because funding for something like this would be. I'm just thinking of all. Anyway, the, the, the hardest I think is going to be pretty similar to the deflect aspect. Only that instead of absorbing that energy, you will use that energy to do something purposeful with it or just store it. And there's a whole bunch of things you could do. But the thing is the purpose, right? So consider the fact that CMEs don't happen, at least don't look like happen on a frequent basis. I would think leveraging CMEs as a means of actually harnessing energy is something that seems a little, how should I say this? It's like, yeah, I don't know what's not a good source of energy, but it doesn't seem like an ideal source of energy because it's, it's just the frequency of these events. So many years ago, somebody said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about this. I, I'm going back to school for this. I'm gonna, and they, I'm like, what, what, what is, give me an idea. They said, man, it's a big spectrum. In the future, we could throw a wire into the sun, literally. I'm like, what? That kind of looks like a wire going in the sun, by the way. <laughs> Coincidentally. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, with CMEs to sell, I would like, I would like, it probably seems slow, but the impact is so big. This is why I'm talking about this, uh, I guess. But the the harness angle, I think, would be pretty similar to the deflection angle. And I've been putting some content out for Heliogen, which I, be, I really believe is a fantastic idea. And I'm thinking maybe something like that could be leveraged for the harness aspect. So that as the energy is being ex extracted, it's being redirected, then there is a chamber, there's some water, and then you basically have the heliogen process kick in there in order to be able to split the hydrogen from the uh, oxygen. And yeah, so, uh, but the thing is, I don't know what is going to be the next expenditure of energy coming from a CNE and how much water could indeed be broken down into its constituent elements. I would think. I don't know, actually, <laughs> right? I don't know. I don't know. I'll just put the thought out there. It really depends how big the CME is and how concentrated, how much of it can be harnessed. Uh, and you can do a back of the envelope calculation or really to determine if that's even worth your time to harness CMEs for powering uh, something. You could, be, you could power anything with that high volume. So this is this these are the set of thoughts on CMEs, thanks to Antov Petrov. The other ideas that I was thinking of, and once I share the screen again, I think my drawing will be gone. Yeah, so the annotations are gone. Um, if you are watching my video for the first time, uh, this is something I talk about, a few, like. Uh, like not often, but I I I I think there's something here. I'm I'm not an astrophysicist. I don't know anything about aerospace, very little. But I feel that we need, as a species, newer means of pushing stuff in orbit without polluting it more, right? So if this thing, this technology, can be developed and it can be regulated and there's cooperation and we use it for peaceful purposes, then I truly, truly think, suspect is the word actually, that this could be actually a life-saving technology for us. It, it could play a very pivotal role, not just for day-to-day -day means in order to continue to send weight into space, but if and when we need something like this, 
we would have made the investments. That's it. That's all I can say about this. I don't know John Hunter. I maybe tried to email them once. I, I don't think I heard back. Um, it's called John Hunter Space Gun. There's not a lot of content on the web for this, other than I believe a article from Popular Science right here, which I would recommend you watch and take a look at the pictures that come up. I can't share them because there's no picture available in the Creative Commons domain. But basically it's a very interesting concept and the way it works is, the, I'm gonna try to pull this from memory. Say you have water, right? So this is in the ocean, I think you can put this in somewhere. And basically you have a buoy here or life buoy, however you call this whatever you call this, right? And then this thing is holding on to this structure and the structure now looks something like this. I think these are basically metallic frames, but in between that we have a, okay, that didn't work. So I need to save my name. I don't have the specification how big the chamber is, what's going on. But basically you have a, you have this, uh, this, this uh, chamber and this is powered by hydrogen. So you have capsules, right? Depends how big you make this and you, you got to talk to John Hunter. But basically you make capsules and this is not for a heavy cargo. This is for sending smaller stuff in order. I don't know what a good size would be. I think a good size would be something like this bottle, right? This is, I, I think I could, it could be a little bit bigger than this, could be smaller. But yeah, this thing is not designed to send heavy duty stuff into work, like, you know, not in one chunk. You could break it down and then shoot a lot. Of and I've had ideas whereby, uh, I guess I think about some of this stuff uh, when I thought about this before. When you have a revolver, uh, the revolver, the, how do you make this? When you have a revolver, the revolver has chambers, right? Like this, and you're trying to draw them. I don't know how many they are, but it's kind of like circular. So you could have a chamber here, and then you could just feed it. Like you, in the older war movies, they feed the bullets to the machine gun. Somebody's holding it, and somebody's firing it. You don't have to necessarily have people holding it. That's not gonna, you can just automate the whole thing, and you could, Put your payload in like some conveyor belt kind of a thing or this baby chain it, and it would just go through the chamber and shoot it. And so this thing is powered by hydrogen and it can shoot small payloads into orbit. It shoots it directly into orbit. At least the conceptual version of this shoots it directly into orbit. So food for thought for somebody who may be watching this and if you happen to be on the team that's going to be tackling CME directly, okay? I'm just sharing ideas based on what I know, which is limited. The other thing I want to share is the Wikipedia page for non-rocket space launch. I think this is a this is a very interesting list, and I've reviewed this once with my team, and. Again, if you are watching this, I highly, highly encourage you to take a look at this page on Wikipedia, particularly the comparison of space launch methods. This is the comparison for the different non-rocket specific, 
no, actually rocket propulsion is also here. All of the things we can potentially leverage in the near term, I mean, like based on the technology readiness level, I'll talk about that in a second, is here. I'm not talking about portals and you know sci-fi stuff. I don't think that's in the But you know, it has rockets and it has other ideas of the very least. So this is the case. And we may have to develop some of these things in a short time frame, it depends, you know, and not just for CME, uh, other things. So this, this is an important page, I think. And if you look at an expendable rocket, technology readiness level is nine. I think that's the highest rate. That means it is, the system is tested, launched, and is in operation, right? One is that research is happening somewhere along this line, and then research may have its own set of readiness levels. Uh, whereas something like a ram accelerator or a space gun is at a six, so it's not necessarily a two, but it's a six, right? So a six is that there's some demonstration that this technology, that's really interesting, I think about it. Now, the other thing I noticed, and maybe somebody else can help uh, shed a bit more light on this, this, this column here, capacity per year, right? So for rockets, it's not really applicable because there's different kinds, and different capabilities. Um, but these definitely catch your eye, right? Um, and I, I haven't spent a lot of time here. This definitely caught my eye. So I started looking at these two. But the problem is these structures are hypothesized to be 80 kilometers high. It's kind of like a hyperloop, the way I understand it. You have a incline and you speed up and you, you go straight in orbit, right? I don't know how you get back. You get back, I guess, however spaceships get back right now. Uh, again, based on what I know, I think I read somewhere the technology makers is ready. And I was thinking, how? Because the tallest structures you build are only like a couple of kilometers long. And this is 80 kilometers high. Okay, that was one thing. The small launch loop, is using the same image. I don't know if it's that high. And if it isn't, I don't know uh, how that would really work. And I also don't know what the cost-based uh, analysis for something like this would be. Because if you build a launch loop, but then it turns out it is so much more cheaper just to send a whole bunch of rockets that are reusable and land them back and say deliver the cargo then maybe it doesn't justify making the actual launch loop. Um, but there are some other there are some other options here. I haven't looked at all of them, as you can see. Okay. So I think I'm gonna keep it to this. This all started with again Anton Petrov. Uh, talking about CMEs, uh, and I've talked about this, and I don't know, I'm not an expert here, I still think uh, the risk is low, but the impact could be pretty significant, if and then, if, 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 if this thing does happen, I would say the same thing about an asteroid impact, but uh, I don't know. I am going to reserve my thoughts on uh, will it happen? Could it happen? Because I don't know. I'm not a, like, you know, this, we got to talk to the people who study this on a on a day-to-day -day basis. I just, it just it looks like based on the recorded evidence that if things like this happen, the impact is going to be quite uh, substantial. So that's it. I'm going to have to do some work now. Thank you for watching. Made this the this video spawned some thoughts in your 
uh, mind and uh, may, may you come up with some ideas and may your ideas uh, serve all of the humans. Uh, what are they Yep, that's really it. <laughs> One last thing I want to say is, you know, I I think about the stuff I put outside because I talk about a lot of things and I cover a lot of territory, and I uh, I know it's I I it's not oblivious to me that the kind of things I talk about could be. Um, Like there's a there's a potential hit, right? Because the, the other video I made about the nuclear aspect and uh, extraterrestrial intelligence may trying to warn us. I do I do think about this uh, that you know this is kind of the thing. These are this that particular topic is topic on the fringe and it has been on the fringe. But I I in in these scenarios I take a look at the evidence and I I've thought about that subject for a really long time as I have shared in the previous video and um, that's a big that's a big cloud that's a beautiful cloud it's a very fluffy <laughs> care bears uh, yeah so I have not just like not to sound I've mean, just thought about that I have wrangled with it in my mind and done the amount, like the top part, like what is the cost of sharing this? And I thought, what is the cost of not sharing this? What was the cost of not sharing it from looking at it from this angle? And after doing that for a couple of days, weeks, I decided to still go ahead with it. And I am gonna stand by my previous work. And unless something I said, is something that doesn't sit well with somebody. I hope you will bring it to my attention. But so that was like more like a like in a higher like thing. This is this is this is this is each one of these things are important in my opinion, and not to sound all that in their own right. And I think these are the issues that we should be thinking about. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much when I stop sharing this feature. I tend to do like a longer thing. But these, I think, I believe these are the issues we should be seriously contemplating. And I think the sooner we do it, the better. And I truly believe that the more collaborative the effort is, the better that it's going to be for us. Um, I also feel that we are chasing feeling, as a species, we chase a lot of feeling, right? So I'm not going to do a longer thing on why that happens. I don't even know. But I think all of these chasing feelings comes at a cost. And so I think we need to, again, I said this before, I think we need to make more conscious decisions that the feelings we're actually ch chasing are, are contributing to our overall well-being and to our overall uh, survival. So we have to survive and be safe and secure and then do well. Uh, maybe we need to do both of those things in parallel. Uh, yeah, so the content I put out there, I just put it out there based on the fact that I believe that it's really important to talk about this. Uh, clearly, I have a biased angle here from the perspective of how I share we are active in this space. So it's not that I'm trying to position myself as a thought leader. I, I, I would be very happy to play some role uh, here, uh, me and my team. Uh, I'm also equally comfortable in leading some of these uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, so I'm totally. Uh, if if uh, I didn't see, we didn't see a lot of people taking the charge on the global healthcare side of things. So we just decided to do it, and we didn't see anyone focused on taking the functional steps to terraform Venus. So we did it, we we're doing that. And I also didn't see anyone taking the functional steps to make Gerard O'Neill's vision come true. So we took the first step, right? So we, we just go into these areas, not because we think of ourselves very highly 
I think we're adept and we wake up early and we do the work. We just do this because tackling this could help make our lives and the lives of my children, my child, and the world at large better. Um, at least that is what I believe are my intentions. <laughs> I don't know how unconscious processing works. So let's be 100% open and honest about it. But to come back to the topic, I sincerely believe that these are issues worth seriously not just thinking about, but putting some kind of a structure in place to tackle this. Because in the domains of some of these existential risks, they may materialize very rapidly. And if you have hours or minutes left for the impact to happen, uh, I think it's, unless there are AIs that can put a solution in place. And if there are AIs, I guess the question is, why is there so much suffering in the planet, right? So I don't, I don't think there are, is any AI that can actually assist us in a moment like that. At least it's not out of the black lab that it's in or whatever secret thing it may be uh, in, which is an assumption I'm making. What I'm saying is I really believe there should be some kind of structure to develop something here. And the cost of not doing that would not be good. And that's it. I don't want to close on that note, but I just want to trigger some thoughts. Uh, we, we need to do something here. I think we need to at least, like, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to be. We need to put some solution here. Um, and it has to be global and it has to be cooperative. And this is a very important, every, every, I would think, even like, I would think, I would think about this sometimes. I don't want to go out on the philosophical level. You know, I think each, each generation deals with their own set of problems and stresses and enjoy life, not exactly in that order. And I, maybe like previous generation, people would think, maybe in the previous generation would think, oh, the kind of issues I'm dealing with is like the most pivotal time in the human history, right? I think it's an ongoing thing and each generation goes through these feelings and I think we go through this individually as individuals um, with different stressors acting upon us and you know just like what's going to be my contribution to the world it doesn't mean you have to do something big or like you know a mega project or anything like that it's just I think our thinking makes our reality. So we are living in this reality because uh, the, the thinking of the previous generation helped spawn ideas and thoughts uh, that we, the reality that we enjoy today is an increasing world of abundance. And I, I think that we, we need to extend the branch, right? Uh, I think Ray Kurzweil uses this example that, uh, Actually, when I was picking mulberry outside, I took a branch and I extended another branch and I had access to a lot of mulberries. Uh, and it's a metaphor, actually, in this case, it happens to be accurate. But what I'm saying is, by tackling some of these risks, we could also extend our reach, enable a world of abundance for everyone, and just create better conditions. I think it's possible, right? It's actually really simple. Fund children's education through Sesame Street, through Khan Academy, through other means. Put a healthcare structure in place. Protect the biosphere. Have switch to renewable energy. Reverse the effects of climate change. Focus on the you know two three billion maybe of us who are living on less than a dollar a day, which includes me by the way. So I'm not trying to you know I'm not saying it's somebody else. That's me. I'm living on less than a dollar a day. Uh, I'm almost living on less than a dollar a day. Uh, depends how you look at it, right? And I've been trying, so I'm not going to go on that thing, but, but you know, these are the kind of areas you need to focus on. And uh, I'm not trying to position myself for some global leadership position or anything like that. I've got too many, like Tim Ferriss would say, I've got too many skeletons in my closet, whatever that means. 
I'm just trying to survive, man. But I also think some of these things are really important. So I hope if you watch this for the two hours, then just listen to my commentary for the last 10, 15 minutes, because that's how I think I am coming to this conclusion. I always say I think because what if I'm wrong? What if however my unconscious thought work is different? You got to leave, leave a little bit of room for uh, you know, keeping that as a, as a thought for the various. But yeah, this this is my this is my this is my thinking on the overall topic of CMEs and uh, the three areas that I explored were deflection. Uh, it, it all of them involve detection. And that's given in all three, but deflection, uh, harness, and destruction. Uh, I'm not sure about the third one, uh, but maybe there's a way to do that. But I still put it there and shared a couple of different ideas, made these ideas blossom, uh, maybe actually make something uh, that maybe uh, I help contribute to in some way, even though it's just a series of thoughts uh, today. Uh, and thanks to Antal Petrov for <laughs> firing these neurons and getting us thinking about uh, coronal mass ejections. Anton is a very good uh, content producer and he's always talking about good things. And I'm glad that, you know, um, he, he does that. I don't know him personally, but shout out to Anton Petrov and I'm out. My legs are gone numb. <laughs> um, have a nice day. Thank you very much. <laughs>